Oh man, it's, 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 uh, they just ruined the sport. These uh, the the tight supportive gear has has just uh, has just ruined it for me. You know, I, I I think you should show up in a singlet and a t-shirt and maybe a belt and see how much weight you can lift. Welcome. To Corporate Warrior, the podcast that brings you the best advice on how to improve your health, optimize performance, and maximize productivity with your host, Lawrence Neal. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $1,000 off software licensing when you order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter Corporate Warrior in the How Did You Hear About Us field. This podcast is brought to you by HitUni.com. HitUni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high-intensity training qualifications. HitUni comes highly recommended by the best in the field, including Body by Science co-author Dr. Doug McGuff, Discover Strength CEO Luke Carlson, and trainer and founder of Bay.com, Drew Bay. It was founded by my friend, author, and longtime personal trainer, Simon Shawcross, who's also been a guest on the podcast. Simon has 15 years' experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high-intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite-sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course. So this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer, but you want to learn more about high-intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount on any course you purchase, simply head on over to hituni.com, that's H-I-T-U-N-I U-N-I, dot com, and enter the coupon code CW10, that's CW in the number 10. So again, head on over to hituni.com, pick your course and enter the coupon code CW10 for 10% discount. Thank you for your support. Hello ladies and gents, I am Lawrence Neal and welcome to another episode of Corporate Warrior, the podcast that teaches you how to optimize your high intensity training protocol and your hit business to help you achieve your health, fitness and business goals. My former guests include New York Times bestselling authors like Gary Torbs and Adam Zickerman, high-intensity training specialists like Dr. Doug McGuff, David Landau and Tim Ryan, Mark Sisson, Rob Wolf, Ben Greenfield, Dr. Sean Baker, Dr. Ted Naiman and many, many more. My next guest is The Sickness, Doug Holland. And I know you guys have been looking forward to this one. Doug is owner and operator of Intelligent Exercise in Louisiana. He's revered by many of the top high-intensity training experts. I've had on the show and he's had a ton of success training people using high intensity training principles and helping people become great power lifters. Doug has also had a very successful
successful powerlifting career of his own. We talk about how Doug got into high intensity training and powerlifting, how he uses his own methods to optimize progress for his clients in terms of reaching their genetic potential and muscular development. We talk about how he prepares for powerlifting competitions and much, much more. This was a lot of fun. As many of you know, Doug is really one of a kind, truly lives life his own way, and clearly just does not give a fuck about what anyone else thinks. And I absolutely love that. This was however more of a conversation than an interview uh, and I'm looking forward to dig a little bit deeper in the future by doing a part two with Doug. For all of the show notes and links for this episode and all episodes please go to corporatewarrior.org and don't forget to hang around at the end when you can find out how you can get a free google sheet to track your hit workouts and a podcast transcript ebook from me and now I give you the one and only Doug Holland. Doug, welcome to Corporate Warrior. Uh, thanks for having me, man. Been looking forward to it. Likewise, I've been very excited about this. And uh, yesterday, I put out your um, one of your great pictures where you're doing a deadlift um, from I don't know how long ago it was, but um, put it put it out on the social media, and it went crazy. So people are excited. <laughs> <laughs> people are excited to hear what you have to say. Um, is that the one with the Is that the one with the big furry beard? Uh, that's right. Um, Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's. I think. I'm not sure if it's one you sent me or one I found on Google Images, but it's epic. It's, okay. Uh, it's got a grainy look to it. It's kind of old school. Um, oh, okay. So it went down quite nice. So Great. you've got this nickname, um, and I should also also say preface this with I pro- my listeners probably know a lot more about you than I do, um, and I didn't mm-hmm. want to do too much in the way of research because I, I like to learn in this format uh, through a conversation. So you have this this nickname called the Sickness. Where does that yeah. come from? <laughs> well, actually, that's a nickname I gave to, to one of my sons uh, many years ago. And um, one day, Greg Anderson and I were talking on the phone about uh, something crazily insane. I can't remember what it was. And he was so taken with what I had said. He said, he said, fuck, man. He said, he said, you're the sickness. And so he he took the name from my son and he gave it to me, you know, <laughs> So um, I'm, 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 I was quite honored by that. So that that's that's where that came from. Well, it, it just stuck. I, 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 it just stuck. You know, I think I think Skyler Tanner picked it up. Uh, uh, a few local uh, people have have uh, have picked up on it. Who have gone out to the web and kind of uh, secretly investigated me before they started working out with me. So you know. <laughs> So they'll so. Google the sickness before anything else. Right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually saw um, uh, Dr. Doug McGuff, who um, I know obviously you know quite well, mm-hmm. um, right. and I'm a huge fan of his work. Um, I saw that he had a, a T-shirt on um, yes. on his Instagram, and I'm pretty sure it was of you, and it had the sickness written on it. Is that did you right. did you create those T-shirts? Is that from you, or is that someone else? That was from Greg and his oh. wife and Anne Marie. They ma- they made a one off T shirt and they they sent it to me and um, I kind of outgrew it, you know, um, as far as uh, size, a little, little bit a <laughs> little bit too small for me. So I I sent it to McGuff and because he he is also a big uh, Greg Anderson fan as as you know. So oh yeah yeah I re- I've read the so so he Doug. Doug McGuff uh, deserves it. Yeah, that's cool. Um, no, I, I remember. Well, I wasn't um, into high intensity training when you know, Greg sadly passed away. But um, from what I can see, in terms of all of the blog posts and things that are written about him, he sounds like an incredible uh, person and personal trainer. So shame I couldn't have started this a long, long time ago and um, you know spoken to him when he, when he was around. Yeah, mm. great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, so that that I just wanted to, I guess, start off with that because I'm really, I was really curious as to how you how you got that nickname um, and then how that kind of spread. How did you get into high intensity training? Um, Athletic Journal. Right. Um, just I just found the Arthur Jones articles in um, early uh, issues of Athletic Journal, and. Then I kind of dug a little bit deeper, and I found the original uh, um, series in the old uh, old Iron Man magazines. 
Mm-hmm. And later, I started reading articles out of Powerlifting USA by Ken Leisner. And it just all came together. You know, uh, this is this is something this is something great. You know, this is this is very exciting because both of those writers, Arthur Jones and and Ken, uh, Ken Leisner, uh, had this passion about what they were writing about. And I just kind of took it and applied it to my own training. Why do you think that you took to that and kind of zoned in on, on their, their methods and principles and applied that, whereas most people don't? You know, most people would have picked up those magazines and they would have, I assume, probably been more drawn towards you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger's high volume training or fill in the blank, you know, more traditional approach to bodybuilding. Why is it that you picked it up and applied it and most people don't, do you think? Well, um, you know, I was I was listening to a, a little snippet of the of the Steve Maxwell interview you did, um, the last one, mm-hmm. and he talked about how he was always working, he was working his way through college, working his way since he was about twelve or thirteen years old. I I was the same way. I was always I always had a job, you know, I always had things to do after school, in high school, or between classes when I was in college. So I, I couldn't go to the gym and stay there for two, two and a half, uh, three hours. You know, I had, I had to get to work. So it just, it just kind of fit right into um, my schedule. Just, just as simple as that. So you think, okay. So you think anyone who's a real kind of busy, uh, in the career or as an entrepreneur back then, it was an obvious, they were more attracted to that way of training just because it was way more efficient from a, for a start for, for uh, from a t- from a time standpoint mm. you know yes i i wasn't going to give up training you know i was going to get my training in but you know <laughs> you have you go to work out you got to change clothes you got to get back to your dorm or your apartment you got to take a shower you got to get to work you know well let's let's condense this workout down to 27 to 35 minutes and and get on with it you know According to your your interview you did with um, Drew Bay way back, which I'll link to, um, you had other pastimes that were quite important to you back then as well, right? <laughs> Namely, I, I had, chasing I had... the ladies. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, you got to have time for that, you know. So. <laughs> yeah, it's like every every other paragraph there was some mention about you uh, focusing on that. That that became more important than the training. <laughs> Uh, equally, 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 equally. equally. It, yes. <laughs> so, can you just kind of um, tell me how high intensity training evolved from there for you? So, how it informed your training thereafter in terms of, you know, your, I guess, introduction to training back in the day, but then also when you started getting into powerlifting and that type of thing. How, where, where did high intensity training come into all of that? Okay. Um. The powerlifting came first, and uh, the guys that I worked out with, you know, we were working out three days a week, maybe sometimes only two days a week. Um, and then later, when I started reading some of the, some of the Leisner articles, I thought, well, you know, I can I can kind of trim this down, and um, instead of doing six or seven or eight sets of squats i can do a limited warm-up of squats and then do two hard sets and be done with with that lift and then you know take a three or four minute break and move on to the bench press and do the same for that and then after that throw in maybe some assistance exercises and then and then go home you know so the Traditional uh, long workouts came first, and then I just kind of evolved into the into the uh, the high intensity. Of course, I didn't have access to the Nautilus machine. I just kind of figured out that you know resistance is resistance. You can apply this to any modality. So that's uh, that's how I got into into kind of tailoring the the hit to the to the powerlifting. What did when is this walk us through like when you were preparing for let's say a powerlifting competition? So okay. twelve, six, three months out. What did your training okay. protocol look like? So 
in terms of like yeah the, the entire training protocol from that far out to to very close to the competition okay i would uh generally start with um a little bit higher reps and i mean the the, the weights were always heavy for the for the required reps you know let's say that i was going to start out with eights on the squat and sixes on the bench press and deadlift the eighth rep on the squat was always going to be doubtful okay likewise the sixth reps on the bench presses and deadlifts were always going to be something that i was really going to have to work hard to to complete and i simply used a double uh, progression system you know complete the reps jump weight next workout and hopefully get those eight reps from there and then as the meat got closer i would trim those eights in the squat down to fives and trim those sixes and and uh, in the bench press and the um, deadlift down to fours, you know, and I never went below uh, a three rep max in the gym. I always saved the the maximum attempt for the platform on meet day. Right on competition day. Right, exactly. Right. And when you dropped it, when you sorry, when you dropped the repetitions, were you increasing the resistance as you did that? Oh, oh yes, right, yes, yes. Okay, so obviously, yes. Okay, so when you were at three reps, or if you ever went that, uh, when you went that low, that would be significantly heavier than when you were at eight reps. Let's say exactly, yeah. exactly. And the way I used to do it is I would I would get me a big piece of cardboard, and I would make a calendar out of it, and I would like plan backwards, you know. With, with the last week before me, you know, nothing being done. The second week before me, maybe a workout on that Monday, but nothing on, on Thursday. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then I just, I just write out my, my, my goals, um, backwards on this calendar and just go from there. I had calendars pinned up all over my wall. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so you'd reverse engineer it basically. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Did you ever, um, did you ever like implement like a strict high intensity training protocol at any point where you were doing like a single set to failure type? Because I've seen you do those types of workouts on, in your, on your YouTube video. Yeah, that came probably, um, oh, I, w I took a mini, I, I took a mini retirement from powerlifting back in the late eighties. And I, I just, I just did strict high intensity training for about four or five years. And then, um, the platform called me back. So I went, I went back to more of a high intensity powerlifting type, uh, workout. And then I retired again and I went back to traditional, um, high intensity training. Well, the high intensity powerlifting, uh, would be something like, well, I would mix up the barbells with, with the machines. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, I'd do like a set of barbell squats until my form started to break down. I wouldn't go to failure, you know, um, I didn't want to get injured. Uh, from there, I would take, a, you know, about five or six or 15 breaths, and I would go to like a preloaded uh, deadlift bar that, you know, sitting nearby on the floor and grind out a set of reps there and then take another short little walk around break, sip of water. And then jump in the hammer leg press and grind out some reps on that. And then take maybe a two-minute break and, and finish up with two upper body movements, a push and a pull. And that'd be it. That'd be it. You know, done. Do you should have been done after the first it should have been done after the first three <laughs> exercises. <laughs> you um so, someone made a, a comment which uh I could see you illustrated actually in one of your, your videos is it would look like, and from what you're saying, it sounds like you you will you will only go to concentric failure or muscular failure on, right. like, on like certain exercises. But when it comes to powerlifting stuff like deadlifts, squats, you'll never go mm -hmm. to failure. Is that unless you're obviously that, doing a a one rep max like on a competition day? Right, 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 right. You know, if, if there is any doubt, you know, I, I, what I what I called it was form breakdown. I would go to form breakdown. When the form started to, get, to turn to shit, I'd say, okay, I'm going to put this up because things are about to become unsafe. You know? Yeah, makes sense. Now, you're quite 
famous for your post deadlift beer ritual, Doug. Yes. Where does this yeah. come from? <laughs> oh, it it comes from being a Bayou boy and living down here in the South, and um, <laughs> <laughs> just just the just the lifestyle that we have around here, and you know we're um, we're we're a different breed, you know. Um, um, I did at one time actually used to drink a beer before, uh, deadlifting really? <laughs> and, um, that came about one time, um, a friend and I were about to have a deadlift workout back in the mid eighties and he called me up and he said, I need to cancel the workout. We'll, we'll do it tomorrow. I said, okay, you know, so that's fine. So. I had a couple of beers. I was sitting on the couch and I'm not sure what I was doing. And he called back and he says, Oh, I got my stuff done. We can, we can go ahead and work out today. I said, Oh, fuck. Great. You know, man, I had one of the best deadlift workouts I've ever had. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you think that is? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, just, it was just, it was just enough to make me aggressive, but not enough to make me, to make me drunk. You know, <laughs> how much did you have? Uh, Probably two. Okay. So yeah. do you think also the beer helped kind of numb some of that lactic acid burn or something during the training? I don't think, no, I don't think so. It was just a nice refreshment. <laughs> That's funny. Um, okay. So really interested to talk, I guess, talk more about, I guess, the influence of high intensity training into your, so on your powerlifting career. Um, do you think, do you think it, that your approach to, powerlifting and, and how you were able to obtain your you know your prs was greatly influenced by the your ability to embrace some of the high intensity training principles you know in that your your volume of training may be less than that of your rivals um yeah i believe so I, you know i i think you just have to understand it before you look at it on a piece of paper you know uh there was a i had a um a, a very good uh, I, I have a very good friend and a former competitor. He was in my weight class. And every time we'd go to a meet, I would always beat him by by pulling a bigger deadlift. And he said, man, he said, you got to write up your deadlift work uh, w- uh, workout for me. I said, no, I'm not going to do it. And he said, why? I said, because when you see it, you're not going to believe it and you're not going to implement it. He goes, he goes, no, no. He says, this time... I, I promise I will. And I said, okay. So we went to a bar. I got a, I got a, I got a bar napkin. I wrote the, the workout out for him on a bar napkin. And I said, here it is. And he took it in his hand and he looked at it. He said, I'm not going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> what was it? It was maybe one or two warm up sets and two uh, work sets. That was it. How how frequently were you doing that? Uh, once a week. <laughs> and what was he doing? Uh, he would be at the gym from three p.m. until probably six. You know, doing set after set after set. You know, and and then sets of shrugs after that, and sets of rows after that, and sets of uh, uh, chin chins after that. You know, so. <laughs> And do you think he was just overtrained? Like, why do you think that you your your uh, training regime was was superior? I, I just don't, I I think he just didn't have the belief that 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 it would work. Mm. You know, you, you know, they the people equate time spent as uh, success. You know, time spent more time spent in the gym uh, equals more success. That's what they believe. Yeah. And it's really it's really more effort. Absolutely. Is what you're looking for. Have you ever sustained any actually before I ask that, um what is your what's your what's talk talk to me about some of your achievements? What are your proudest um your proudest PRs in, in squat and deadlift and that kind of thing or in powerlifting? Okay, let's see. Um at want- one four at one forty eight at one hundred and forty eight pounds, I squatted um, five fifty one five hundred and fifty one pounds. Um, 
as a light 165er, literally weighing probably 151 pounds. I, 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 I failed to make weight on this particular day. As a 151 pounder, I squatted 100. I mean, uh, I squatted 562 pounds. Um, Unbelievable. Deadlifted at 148. Uh, routinely in the 500s, and I think my best was like a 540 or a 545. And sadly, I had a shitty bench press. I only bench pressed about 303, and I think I only did that one time. But but that was before the uh, the advent of the stupid bench press shirt. So I did it in a cotton t-shirt. So, <laughs> what a difference does that make? Oh man, is this the, uh, they just ruined the sport? These uh, the the tight supportive gear has has just um, has just ruined it for me. You know, right? Okay. Um, I, I I think you should show up in a singlet and a t-shirt and maybe a belt. And see how much weight you can lift. Does the tight gear really make a big difference? Oh yes, yes it does. How come? It does. Well, it's it's just it's just so restrictive that you can't even move. You have to have weight on you to to do the negative portion of the lift. And then when you get to the bottom of the negative, it creates a spring to help you get the weight uh, out of the hole of the right. squat or off your chest on the bench press. Hmm. Interesting. So did you ever sustain any, any serious injuries doing powerlifting at all? Um, a twinge here and there, but nothing that would, um, make me, uh, retire or quit or take a lot of time off. You know, any injury I had came from playing in the huge waves at the beach or, or, uh, <laughs> automobile accidents or things like that. So, that's so rare to hear because mm -hmm. even yeah it is. Do you know what I mean? Because obviously yeah. powerlifting can be high risk if not done safely, oh, yeah. and even some would argue even if it's done safely, it's it's not advisable if you have alternatives for exercising those same muscle groups. Um, mm -hmm. So that's interesting. So how how have you been able to avoid injury or any major injuries from what it sounds like your entire career? Um. I think part of it was just kind of cycling the weights and, you know, if I, if let's say that I went in for a deadlift workout and just didn't feel right, I'd say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm just going to stop right here and wait till next week, you know, or, you know, I've done the same thing on squat before, you know, it's just, ah, it just doesn't feel quite right today. I'm going to, I'm going to get in the car, go home and we'll come back a few days later. Um, but mainly just cycling the reps and paying a lot of attention to form 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 first and, and uh poundage second did you never have the angst to get back in the gym because it it sounds like you embraced a low frequency even in a powerlifting context at an early age um whereas obviously everyone else is is probably working out far more frequently did you not ever have this urge just to get back in the gym or were you not wired that way uh, in the early days, I think we were, we, I think we're all wired that way, right? you know, but you know, later on with, uh, with more things to do more outside interest, you know, it was just, um, it was okay to wait. Plus the angst was taken over by the excitement that you, you get to go on Thursday, you know, you, here, you know, it's, it's, it's only Tuesday, man, I can't wait till Thursday. You know, I get to go back to the gym. <laughs> <laughs> So what what were you training back in those days? Like twice a week, three times a week, or uh, I was going probably Monday, Thursday, either a Monday, Thursday, or a, or a Tuesday, Saturday, some, something like that. How tall are you, by the way? Five three. Oh really? Five five foot three. Yeah. No way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, way. I yeah. would never have guessed that um, because you're. Oh right. So... I, used, I used to be tall. I used to be five four. <laughs> <laughs> It's, that's so interesting because um yeah obviously i've watched you on video a lot you sent me a lot of videos over the past few uh few few months um but i it, obviously I'm i never see you with anyone so i can't tell um your height but when i heard you obviously listing your weights just now um mm -hmm. 
I just wondered whether or not you were ever someone who sort of struggled to gain muscle mass, but obviously based on your height, you're quite, you know, you have, you're quite mesomorphic. Is it, have you ever struggled with putting on with muscular development or putting on weight or is that always something that's kind of come quite naturally to you for your career? Uh, man, it was, it, no, man, it, it, it's been a struggle, you know, uh, I, I, I do not have an impressive physique. I have, uh, I'm, I may have impressive, uh, pieces, you know, um, I used to have just fantastic traps and, uh, quads, quads were pretty good. Um, my lower back at, a, uh, at one time was, it was like two, uh, side by side Python snakes, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, mainly, you know, uh, my muscles developed, uh, uh, traps, uh, front deltoids, lower back and quads and um never had any never had never had good biceps never had uh big triceps no calves you know they they just it just wouldn't work for me you know so i just take what i can get well for what it's worth doug i think you look damn good in the videos i've seen all right you're thank looking, you you look in very good shape very good shape 58 58 as well yep 58 yeah. yep so what is the what does the current workout regime look like at the moment? Um, I've, I've kind of broken down to like a big two, sometimes a big three, you know. Um, like tomorrow, I've got on the the book. I'm going to do the um, the Frank Zane leg blaster, and <laughs> probably do some weighted chins after that, and that that'll probably be it, you know. What is the Frank Zane leg blaster? What does that entail? Oh, you know, that's the, that's the machine that, that that's when well, it's not a machine. Uh, it's an apparatus that Frank Zane, uh, has been manufacturing for a few decades. Uh, you wear, you wear a harness and you hold on to like this, uh, this bar for, for balance. And it's, uh, it's kind of a cross between a, uh, uh, a belt squat and a, a safety squat bar. And, um, I picked it up from a failing gym here locally for seventy five dollars, so I couldn't couldn't pass it up. <laughs> nice, sounds like a bargain. Uh, I thought when you said leg blaster, I thought it was going to be like some kind of routine based. Oh, so, oh, 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 yeah, oh, yeah, three so, horrible yeah, no, exercises no. or something. <laughs> no, no, no. It's just it's just it's just an apparatus. Yeah. Cool. And uh, you have this fascinating gym, which I'm going to ask you some questions about in a bit. Um, but before I get there, I just want to ask you some more questions about exercise specifically. Now, okay. I've got, I had a, loads of questions submitted. We've got through some of those already. Um, but I have some people who have, you know, who have been involved in high intensity training for a while. Um, and you know, as you know, there's so much debate online about, you know, what's the most effective protocol for muscle gain and, you know, people are constantly arguing about the, the real nuances of training. Um, mm -hmm. what's your feeling about super slow? Do you think that super slow works for everyone in, in terms of a training protocol? Or do you think there are some people who, when doing a super slow protocol, they don't respond well to it? Okay, this is what this is what I'm going to say about that. Super oh. slow is misunderstood, especially by the critics who've never tried it or the people who have tried it for maybe three workouts and never got deep in enough into it to understand what a true super slow rep is. Okay? Mm-hmm. Now, let's say that I'm going to I'm going to get on my uh my modified Nautilus torso arm machine. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pile the weight on. I will purposely slow the first rep down, okay? I can yank it if I want to. I'm not going to. I'm going to pull it down cleanly. I'm going to pause it in the contracted position. I'm going to take it up under control. Okay? Mm -hmm. The next rep I'm going to, I'm going to do the same thing. Although I'm going to have to put a little bit more focus, um, on not yanking it by the third rep. I'm going to want to almost be yanking it so I can get the goddamn thing down. Okay. <laughs> and by the fourth rep, if I get it, it may take 13 to 18 seconds to complete it. 
And then I've got to fucking hold the motherfucker in the contracted position before it rips my arms, I, I, um, I, my shoulders <laughs> I, 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 out of the sockets. Okay. And I've got a, a, um, example of this on video where I think the first rep is like five, three. The second rep's about six, three. The third rep's about 12, four. And the last rep, I think it takes me 16 seconds to complete the positive rep. Okay. Mm-hmm. I'm not trying to go 16 seconds. I'm trying to get that son of a bitch down, you know? (laughs) So, yeah, I think super slow works, but you've got to, you just can't go through the motions. You can't go slow. You've got to have, you've got to have enough weight on there and enough effort preceding the final reps that it has to be slow because you, you can't blast through it at that time. Yeah. You know, I, I, I mean, I, I tell clients, I say, okay, now here, here it comes. Here comes the rep. Now, I want you to start slow for half an inch, and I want you to push as fast as you can. But you know what? It's not going to go fast because you have nothing left. Mm. And I, I've got to spit that out. I've got to spit those words out quickly, you know, and it, it happens every time. They cannot move it fast. I say, I want you to almost try to cheat. I want you to try to break form. Get that, get that motherfucker to come in. That they, they can't do it. They can't go fast. Do you curse but, uh, at your but, clients during the exercise? <laughs> uh, they're, they're, you have to pick, pick and choose which ones can take it. You know? <laughs> yeah, I, I do. I'd, I'd I do. love that. I'd love to trade with you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I completely agree. And this is a really interesting, uh, interesting answer you gave because the way I see it, based on everyone I've spoken to and the research I've done in my own experience, I feel like cadence isn't even important. What's important is that you actually reach momentary muscular failure or close enough if you're looking mm-hmm. for optimal muscular development. And so long as mm-hmm. you're getting there, the cadence, the number of sets, that doesn't really matter. That's certainly my opinion, but I really was keen to get... Do, do, do you? Sorry, do you agree with what I just said? Is, is, do you have any issue with... With that at all? No, 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 no. I, you know, I, as long as you don't yank or explode into the, the first half inch, and as long as you don't stab the end point or uh, yank the end point in, I think the body of the repetition will take care of itself. Okay? Mm-hmm. You just get it moving without throwing it. Get it close to the um, lockout, if it's a pushing exercise, without jamming into it and then make a smooth turn and come back. And, you know, each rep should have its own uh, different natural speed according to how much fatigue has, has set in. What, uh, what sort of um, strategy strategies and tactics do you employ with your clients for progression? So when you've had someone in who's maybe done, you know, I don't know, like whatever standard protocol you recommend someone start with, right? Um, let's mm-hmm. say they've, they've, they've really started plateauing. How, mm-hmm. how do you personally, like what tactics do you employ personally to help people get past sticking points? If at all. Well, um, that's kind of one of, one of the reasons, um, I have so much equipment. You know, if you get stuck on a certain exercise, I can take you to a different piece of equipment and put you on it for a few weeks just to, just to get the bugs out, you know, just to give you, just to get, just to refresh you a little bit and give you something different to, to, to try to do. Mm -hmm. And then, and then without telling you, I can move you back to that piece that you were stuck on and, you know, you'll probably break through on your first workout. Do do you see that happen regularly? I I do. I do. Why is that? Um, I think people, you know, I, I think they get not bored. They just start to expect. They start to expect that they're, that they're not going to uh, improve on a particular uh, exercise. You know, it's like, oh God, here, here's this piece. I can't stand this piece of equipment. You know, it's they they get they get that attitude. You know. <laughs> 
So you think that they that by moving them onto another machine or alternative exercise, you're going right. to continue to increase their strength ideally, and then when they right. come back, they've they've perhaps got increased strength and not the same trepidation about a specific machine. Right. Do you think that's right. the, the formula? <laughs> right. And 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 sometimes I'll put them on the piece they were stuck on. I'll give them uh, five or six extra pounds. I won't even tell them, you know. And I'll yeah. say, grab it, grab the handles. Let's go, you know. And they they just go right through it like nothing ever happened. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting. One of the things I've spoken about uh, recently a bit with Drew, actually, I've had him on the show a few times recently, and we we've also talked about this in um, on the blog and the comments. But there's this. It would seem that some people fall within a certain um, time under load, right, in a mm-hmm. certain exercise, and mm-hmm. you can you can you can increase that weight you know, quite a lot and they'll still fall within the same range. Um, Correct. Yes. So it almost becomes uh, a, 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 uh, not a, really an ideal pursuit to be trying to increase one's time under load than beyond a certain window. Right. Ra- rather it'd make more sense to just start increasing resistance or, you know, if, if they want to continue to progress. It's, do you, do you mm-hmm. follow that same kind of mindset towards training? I, I, I do. And, but I've also, you know, I've, I'll, I've also thrown in uh, lately some some rest pause type um, um, work with people like that to say, well, well, okay, you're in the squat machine. Let's let's grind out these first four reps, and when you get close to lockout, I want you to kind of just hold it out there. Okay, just hold it out there. Just hold it out there. Don't lock out. Just kind of hold it out there. All right. When you're ready, give me two more reps. Okay, one. To, okay, hold it out there. Hold it out there. Hold it out there. And then we, we just keep going, you know. So I had a client yesterday. She did four reps on the hammer uh, squat machine. I let her hold it out there. She grabbed two more. I let her hold it out there. She grabbed two more. And she finished ultimately with a tough set of 13 reps. Almost had to carry her. I almost had to get up there and carry her down the machine <laughs> where had we been using just the regular protocol, she may have gotten five reps before it shut her down. Do you think there ever is a risk of overtraining and that, using that type of protocol on someone? No, because I only give her that every third week. So, okay. Yeah. Now I think, a a fair few of my listeners and i guess people that get drawn to high intensity training in general tend to be hard gainers you know mm-hmm. like they right. they're guys who have or girls who have tried many different exercise protocols looking for the magic bullet which you know any of us who have been training long enough knows doesn't exist <laughs> um mm-hmm. and and so with that, you know, a, a fair number of my listeners are going to be hard gainers. You know, I'm quite ectomorphic myself. I don't put on muscle mass very easily. Um, not beyond what I, what I gained in my first probably couple of years of training, uh, in my early twenties. So when you've got a client like that who comes in, who is like, you know, can't Doug, I want to, I want to maximize my muscular development. Like, what, what do you have a, do you have that kind of like conversation to bring them down to earth first? <laughs> And then if you do or don't, what what does a training protocol typically look like when you've got someone like that? Well, first thing I got to bring in, you know, is, is, is how old, how old they are, you know, because, because here's, here's what we know. Uh, You know, people talk about research about uh, high intensity training versus standard uh, weight training. Here is what we know right here. You know, if, if you're 13, or 15 or 18 or 20 or 22 years old. If I give you a barbell and say, go work out uh, three days a week. Uh, Here are some exercises you can pick from. I don't care if you do them or you don't, you know, just, just, just do a few exercises uh, uh, three days a week. Guess what's going to happen. You're going to grow and you're going to get stronger. Okay. It's just, it's just going to happen. Yeah. Okay. That much we know, but, if you come to me and you're 45 years old and you've uh, never uh, done anything, you know, it's, it's, it's going to, it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough. You will, you will put on some muscle. You will get harder. You will get leaner. Uh, you will get stronger, but 
just not quite sure we're going to, you know, really give you notice, noticeable uh, physique changes that would just that are just going to blow you, blow your mind. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. So, um, but I've had I've had pretty good success. I've got some pretty muscular clients uh, presently in their uh, late forties. Early fifties. I got a couple in their sixties. Nice. But 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 they know what to expect as far as the effort that they have to put in. Mm. Is it what, what from from reading I guess reading between the lines and what you were saying just now, um is it almost like you're saying, you know, if you've got a new client in, let's just say a young man, twenty five years old, who's like, mm-hmm. Doug, I wanna you know, I wanna build as much muscle as I um, physically able what mm-hmm. you were kind of saying just now is basically any protocol is going to get you results <laughs> so long as it's yeah yeah you know the, the, the machines don't matter so long as it's right. like you know intense enough and you're not doing it too right. frequently that you're going to get right. what you can get is that is that true is that fair to say is that aligned with what yeah. you think in your experience yeah as long and as long as we don't as long as we don't destroy your body in the process you know um yeah, you, you know, you you want to be a consistent trainer. You don't want to go do something insane like ring dips and tear your shoulder up where you can't work out for six months. You know, mm. <laughs> we we uh, we got to protect you in the process so that you can you can come work out uh, once or twice a week for fifty two weeks. What do you think about things like CrossFit and kettlebells? Oh God! <laughs> uh, don't ask. get me started. Don't don't get me started. You know, um, uh, the, the, what what bothers me about CrossFit is the low standards for being a CrossFit instructor and becoming a CrossFit box owner. You know. It's, it's, you know, you, you take this uh, easy test, you take a practical that consists of, 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 of a broomstick instead of a barbell and okay, Lawrence, you're, you can go open up a CrossFit place. Go ahead. You know, Mm -hmm. (laughs) yeah but I love CrossFit because the injured people come to me for rehab. (laughs) What about kettlebells? What's your view on those as a, as a device for exercise and improving i i I, I just uh uh, i have no i have no answer i i I just i have never experienced uh a a kettlebell i I have two kettlebells and uh and they're used as a as a doorstop (laughs) i know someone else who does that (laughs) very good very interesting um Cool. Okay. So, wanted to. Is there? I, I wanted to move on to ask you some questions about uh, some more kind of personal questions, lifestyle questions about you, um, but also your business. Is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with before we move on in terms of exercise? Uh, any, I guess, words of advice for for high intensity training and stuff like that, or powerlifting before we move on? Well, you know, if you if you um, if you want to get into powerlifting. You know, find a coach that's done it before and and find a coach that understands that you need to develop the raw strength without all the supportive gear. You know, that's uh, that's really the best piece of advice I can I can give you on that. Mm, sounds like good advice. So. Um, OK, so. Your business. So you have this really awesome gym called Intelligent Exercise. Um, right. And it is kitted out with everything from what I've seen right. in your video. It's really impressive. And I can real, really see that it's your, you know, it's your baby. You know, it's something you've clearly invested a lot of time and money in and really made your own, which is really, uh, I love to see that. Um, yeah. Can you, yeah, thank you. Can you kind of dis- tell the story of how that came to be? You know, why you started the business, when it started, how long, how it developed, all that kind of stuff. Well, um, I got a. This is a pretty odd story, long, long story. Um, I got my college degree in 
mathematics with a minor in uh, English and um, with an emphasis on 20th century American literature. Okay. Um, um, got out in the world at age 23 and decided I don't want to have a boss. So I had, I had, I had tons of money saved up because I, I was always working. I was working 32 to 40 hours a week as a college student. And I, and, and I, and I never spent any, any money, you know? Um, so I was walking down the street one day and there was a, there was a, a building for rent. And I said, okay, I'm going to open a gym. So I opened up my first gym when I was 23 years old. And, um, uh, it was, um, a tough proposition because there were, there were two free gyms, um, in the town that I was living in at the time. It was, a, it was a college town. So the students had the opportunity to go work out for free at two different places, you know, but still the place, uh, it, it made money. And one of my members was a, uh, a chemistry professor and he kept wanting to buy the gym. I want to buy this gym. I want to buy this gym. And I said, well, fuck, you know, so, so finally I, I said, okay, you, you know, I, I sold him the gym and went back into the regular nine to five world. And, um, God, fuck, I hated it, you know? <laughs> and I said, I said, you and me I, both. I, I, I gotta, I gotta do it again, man. I, I gotta get back and just, I, I cannot, I cannot have a boss, you know? So I moved to Shreveport in 1988 and I established a business out of a, a physical therapy clinic where I was training clients all day and uh, aiding, aiding with the rehab patients all day and um, moved on to a different setting in 91. And I, I always told myself, I'm going to have my own place and it's going to be the best fucking gym and the best kept secret that, that uh, anyone's ever walked into. I didn't care about having an open floor gym with hundreds and thousands of members. I just wanted it to be a place where people could come and train hard one person at a time. So from 97 until 2014, I was paying rent on a building. I had a pretty good, pretty good setup, you know, and then um, my current place came available uh, at the end of 2014. So I just, I just pulled the trigger and bought it, man, moved, moved everything in. Nice. Almost died and almost died in the process of moving all the stuff here. But, you know, how so it was, it it was, it was exciting, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Um, Awesome. That's, that's a, that's a really cool story. So it's really interesting to hear you only do one session at a time. Yet your floor yes. space is massive. Um, yes. you know, a lot of commercial gym owners would think that's, that there's an enormous amount of wastage there, wouldn't they? Uh, but you've been no, very, no, you've been no, very no. deliberate about that. Oh, yeah, yeah. This, this is my church, man. This is where I come and hang out, you know, when I'm not, when I'm not working, I'm, you know, I'm up here, you know, and, um, uh, I live exactly one mile from here. So it's not like I'm driving 45 to 50 minutes to, to get here and back, you know, yeah. um, I can, I can get up. I can get here in three minutes in the morning. You know. Nice. You you mentioned to me how you've done things your own way. Um, you know, is it is it was there ever challenges in this in the beginning? Like you know, if you if that's your philosophy, right? I'm only going to do one on one training. Um, mm-hmm. You know, especially I don't know how what your overheads were like at the beginning, but was there ever a pain point there uh, in terms of like covering your costs? And running your business in the early days, perhaps. Well, in the early days, I was just I was just uh, working out of a out of an existing uh, facility. But I do remember my first two week paycheck. I can tell you exactly what it was. It was one hundred and eighty nine dollars. And I said, "What the fuck have I got myself into?" You know, I've got a hustle. I got a hustle. You know, and man, I started. I started hustling my ass off and within, you know, two and a half years, I, I, I had pretty much 
had uh, put my name out there, you know, as the guy to go to. Uh, but all the time I was saving every every penny. So I never really had those problems about, um, you know, covering the overhead. It, you know, I always had it, you know. Mm. Yeah. That's interesting. <laughs> it's now it's really it's really interesting to to just to hear your your kind of philosophy um, when it comes. I mean, to- I mean, I mean, Lawrence, Lawrence, I'm not afraid to get up at three o'clock in the morning, and I'm not afraid to drive home at 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 seven thirty at night. You know, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get up and kick ass. So when you said it was the best kept secret. Yet you were hustling to get awareness. How did you? Because even now you're not in the business phone book, right? Like you're not. Uh, no, 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 you don't no. do much in the way of marketing. I'm assuming it's all word of mouth now. Is that? Yeah, yeah, that? word of mouth. Yeah, yeah, word of mouth. People, you know, they can find me. They can find me. So how did you grow yeah. when you first? So this, the, the, when you got this facility you have now, how did you grow mm-hmm. that when it first started? The one, the one that I have now. Yeah, intelligent exercise. Yeah. Um. I had, I was working out of a YMCA and the building for rent came available. And I said, man, I gotta, I gotta do this. I've got enough clients. You know, I mean, I mean, I'm, I've always got a legal pad in front of me. I've always got two columns drawn down and I'm always figuring stuff out. I'm always, I'm always, I'm always working the math. You know, I'm always just, just staring at the numbers and, and, you know, trying to find out what works in my favor and what doesn't work in my favor, you know, and I was trying to make the leap from a safe, a pretty safe, uh, contract labor job into, uh, into business ownership. And finally I said, the numbers are in my favor. And I, I jumped and I never looked back, you know, and it was easy. Best decision I ever made. And I'm kicking myself for not doing it when I was, when I was younger. Yeah. Well, you did do it when you were younger, but you sold it, right? Right, right. Yeah. So you were just, you, but you would wish you'd never done the nine to five thing and just kept going in, right. in, in one way or another. Is that, is that correct? Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. No, awesome. I, I, uh, I dream one day to own my own facility. Um, like yours i mean perhaps not as big as yours <laughs> but like something you know i know like an area where it's yours your own like you said it's your church right it's where you go right. to right to be in go, the zone man. and and get, right. your, get your get your training done and yeah no and i totally that that gels with me like that resonates with me i get that um you're just a fascinating guy you email me a list of bullet points he said here's here's some um here's some uh, thoughts about our, our, our interview. And he just li- he sent me a list of bullet points that read, I have no computer, no television. I don't read newspapers. I'm not on Facebook or Instagram. I'm not listening to business phone book. I drive a 45 year old car. I do 109 to 139 appointments per week and I work seven days a week. Let's talk right. about that. <laughs> so what is your aversion to, cause you're, you're quite, you're, sounds like you're pretty contrary and you don't conform to, to your average. So what, what's driven that? Do you think? I don't know. You know, I mean, I've got, I've got, I've got like, uh, I've got the best wife in the world and she's, she and I are complete opposites, um, spiritually and, and politically and artistically, but really as far, yes, really as far as, um, keeping things simple, we're on the same page, you know? And, I think when the Facebook thing took off, I just I just made the comment one day. I said, I'm never going to get on that fucking Facebook. And she said, well, me neither. And <laughs> I said, well, let's let, let's make a pact. You know, we're not going to get on. We're not we're not going to do Facebook. We're not going to do all that crap. And she, and she said, OK. So and so she's uh, she she joined me on that. And um, but, um, you know, there there are one hundred and sixty eight hours in a week and. I probably sleep 35 of them. And I mean, there are things to do, man. There, there are human interactions to, to, uh, to take advantage of the rest, the rest of those hours. So I'm, I'm up and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to do it. What is that? Go on. Sorry. And and not, and not, and not trying to look down at my phone all day long. Something I I need to do less of probably. Um, Now, 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 now I do have a few, 
uh, texting buddies, but most of our texts are maybe one sentence long, and it's usually just about an observation of of, of humor, you know. But uh, <laughs> I am not going to, you know, just be uh, texting back and forth with uh, a friend for for three hours. Yeah, you'd much rather have that face to face interaction right. with someone. You got it. Yeah. How? What does an average day look like for you? Like, let's walk, walk me through from when you literally get out of bed to when you get back in bed later that day. <laughs> All right. Okay. Let's see here. Um, I got my I got my appointment book right here in front of me. So cool. tomorrow I will get up at about four ten a.m. No way. I will be dressed. I'll, I will be showered and dressed by about four thirty-five. Coffee. Uh, no, I'll be yeah. at the gym. I'll be at the gym with the lights on by four forty-five, mm-hmm. and then at five fifteen, I'll take my first appointment, and I'll go nonstop until ten a.m. I'll take a break, and then I'll go um, from eleven twenty until two o'clock. And then I'll take a little break, and I'll go from uh, 3.30 until 7 p.m. Then I go home, sit with my wife. We'll talk for about an hour, and and, um, I'll eat, take another shower, and go to bed, get ready for the next day. Nice. When do you you eat during those breaks? I will – I eat – right now I'm doing some, some fasting. I will eat breakfast at about um, three fifteen tomorrow. After I eat uh, this evening, hang on, three fifteen in the morning. No, no, three fifteen in the afternoon. <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry, I, I got a bit confused. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're not, we're, I think we're in different time zones here, aren't we? <laughs> we, are, we are. We are. <laughs> so, so no. go on. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. you were saying about your diet. And your no, eating, I'll. I'll times. You know, I'll. I'll eat today between between three o'clock and eight o'clock, and then I won't eat. I won't eat again until about three fifteen tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon. Got it. Well, and then you'll have a meal at three fifteen. Then you'll have dinner later. Yeah, as well. yeah. Then yeah. then I'll have then I'll then I'll have a second meal about uh, seven o'clock when I get home. Yeah. So you do the kind of intermittent fasting thing quite regularly, do you? like fast during yes. the mornings? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So do I. Yeah. Sometimes after a hard. Sometimes the day after. A hard a hard workout. I'll I'll break the fast a little bit earlier, you know, because it's just I just feel a little bit hungrier, you know. Sure, probably driven by the workout, right? Right, exactly. And what what's your diet look like? What do you what do you eat? Um, mostly protein. I mean, I I do still eat uh, some carbs, you know, Mm -hmm. but you know, the protein is also is always up at the at the forefront, you know. Yeah. So. You know, I eat pork, I eat chicken, I eat, I eat fish, I eat a lot of mackerel, you know, I eat a lot of sardines, um, uh, steak. Um, we, we probably have, we have, we have some sort of fish probably twice a week, either halibut or salmon, you know. And the, your wife cooks the meals during the evening? Typically, yes, yeah, yes, nice. I need to somehow get that going. I'm not, she, yeah, she's not keen on my my girlfriend's vegetarian, so she won't uh, she won't touch red meat. Really, this is quite difficult uh, for me too, as I tend, <laughs> I tend to uh, eat quite a quite a bit of steak. So I have to cook my own dinner, unfortunately. But you know, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> First world problems. Um. So okay, so that's interesting. So. So you, you, as you say there, you you work a ton. Um, mm-hmm. You work seven days a week, right? Why? Why is it? Why do you have such a, a strong work ethic? Why do you work so many hours? Uh, I, I think it just came from. I think it just came from. Um, you know, as as uh, as kids, there, there there were there were four of us. You know. And if we wanted something, we, we were expected to, to, to work to get it, you know. Um, you know, I, I bought my own – I bought a high-powered Mustang when I was 17 years old. Nice. <laughs> what about – I've got, 
I've I've got a uh, it, it reminds me actually I've got a, a note here to ask you about some bicycle race. Can you elaborate uh-huh. on that? <laughs> <laughs> Who who asked about the bicycle? Who do you think? <laughs> um, was it Drew? And it was Ryan as well. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, I used to, I used to um, I dabbled in competitive cycling back in the early nineties, and then I think the bicycle race in question probably took place around ninety six, ninety five or ninety six. I can't remember, but um, it was actually a Dual athlon. It was a it was a three mile run followed by a um, I think a twenty mile bike race followed by another uh, uh, three mile run. So I went ahead and entered it. I took a one speed bike and I showed up with blue jean cutoffs and just a tank top. And I had made me a helmet that had dinosaur, uh, dinosaur spikes on it. <laughs> and, um, so, and I, I, I didn't have toe clips. It was just me wearing my, my converse high tops, just pedaling regular pedals on this one speed bicycle that probably weighed five times as much as these, as these racing bikes. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, um, I actually finished in the middle of the pack of the entire race and, the other competitors that I beat in all their shiny skin tight uh, attire and their fifteen hundred dollar bikes were were really pissed off. <laughs> so that's that's basically the story right there. So <laughs> did you uh, did you did you do any other races after that? No, that was it. That was it. <laughs> Show up, win, and go home not to return. <laughs> right. Right. It was a blast. Awesome. Um, so this 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 li- lifestyle that you have, which is just really interesting to me because I – I try to to cultivate a similar a similar type of lifestyle. I try to I, I don't consume any sort of media, any news, um, not mainstream media anyway. I try to curate that as much as possible. Um, do you what do you do for fun? Like I, I, I've been told you're a great guitarist. Um, talk to us a little bit about that and what you do for recreation and that type of thing. I am a self taught, trashy, uh, ugly, uh, horrible guitarist <laughs> um i don't know who told you that but um uh here at the gym i've got five amplifiers and every night when i close i i hook them all together with various um boost pedals and i blast away for about 15 20 minutes just 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 crunching just crunching away you know, as loud as I can make it so that the parking lot outside is shaking. Okay. So that's a form of, uh, that's a form of fun right there. Um, I like to, um, pick up old bicycles and, and rebuild them, ride them. Um, I love my old Volkswagen. Uh, I shut the place down four separate weeks out of the year and, um, and go fishing. Okay. And when I'm here in town, I actually have a fishing pier. My, my, my gym is on a bayou. So exact, uh, when I'm here in town, I can actually go out back and fish anytime I want to. So Nice. And you don't have yeah. anyone working for you. It's just you, is it? That's me, man. So you're, you don't have anyone on the front desk. It's literally you doing all no, the jobs. No, I do it. Every, I do it all, man. I do it all. And that would explain yeah. the sign on your door. That's like, don't knock. Big... Don't knock. <laughs> <laughs> and you've got your you've got your rules on the wall. Can you talk us through your rules? Well, since I moved to the new place, I've actually taken those rules down. Oh. Um, but basically, it was like you know, be on time, pay on time, um, don't wear any any uh, any strong uh, perfume. You know, yeah, show up, show up with a uh, gym attire, 
you know, I'm not one of these guys who's going to let you work out in your business clothes. You know, I need to see your elbows. I need to see your knees. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, have an attitude that you're ready to go and, and get this done. You know, don't show up. You know, I, I hate it when people show up and, and they're not ready. You know, I just, I just, I just can't stand that. But, yeah. um, those, those are the basics. And what is it like 15 minute sessions or half hour sessions that you do typically? Or? I book half hour. I, I book half hour and, uh, time spent usually 18 to 22 minutes. Yeah. Right. Okay. And what do, what sort of workout frequency do your clients tend to follow? Is it like once a week or twice a week or more? Does it vary? I, I probably got, I probably got 50, 50 twice a week and the other 50% probably come, uh, come, come, uh, once a week. Interesting. There's, um, fair amount of debate going on in my podcast and on the internet about training frequency uh, and some people think that you know tra- even following something as intense as high intensity training one can get really good results from training very frequently um uh, now i'm just curious to know what are your thoughts on recovery and frequency do you do you tend to recommend that people don't train more than a certain number of workouts per week or what, how do you think about stuff like that well, it depends on, on actually uh, how much effort are they going to put into the workout. Are they really that um, worn down from the workout? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I really think you can look at it from from an exercise to exercise standpoint. You know, you had a tough workout uh, last time you're here because we did the leg press. So let's uh, let's go through and do some maybe some hip work. Maybe some quad work today with the uh, leg extension, and not tax you so much as we did on on Tuesday. So you can take those big lifts mm-hmm. and kind of rotate them in and out of the the, um, the the sessions because that's probably what is is trashing them, not not the workout as a whole. Right, so just some of those, some of those more demanding exercises perhaps need to be swapped right. out on occasion. Right. Mm-hmm. And there's sometimes I don't deadlift for eight or nine weeks. You know, I'll just I'll just pull it out and say, you know, I'm, I'm just I'm just I can I can feel it coming. I can feel it coming where I, I'm not really looking forward to this. So I'll take the deadlift out and I'll plug it back in. And guess what? I can plug in give myself three or four pounds more than I finished off and everything just goes just fine. Mm. Are you so there's a lot of, there's a, there's a lot of psychological stuff going on here too. You yeah, know? for sure. Are you, um, so you, you described your training regime just now briefly. Are you still doing powerlifting now? Are you still competing now as well? No, I, I do the powerlifting movements, mm. you know, but, I, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not competing. My, I've got a, I've got a few guys uh, a few old, a few old friends showed up. They're trying to talk me into doing it again. You know, I'm, I'm not sure if I want, if I want to or not. It's not the training that's hard. It's, it's the making weight because I'm, I'm kind of trapped. Um, I've, I've always been trapped between two weight classes, which is I'm a little bit too heavy. I'm a little bit too heavy for 148, but I'm too light to be a competitive 165. You know. So I've always opted to drop down to, to 148, and the older I get, uh, the less I want to do it. You know, <laughs> right? And that's because you want to hold on to your muscle mass. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. And plus, it's just not fun. You know, I mean, back when I was single, you know, shit, I could live on tuna fish uh, <laughs> forever. You know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's 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 the so it's the dieting as well that you don't enjoy very much. Right. Right. Yeah. Do you, I asked you about coffee earlier. Do you, so you don't drink any coffee? Do you drink coffee at all or tea or anything like that? I've tried to drink coffee. Yeah. I love the, I love the smell of coffee. Uh huh. I mean, you you could take a, a, an empty coffee bag or an empty coffee can and you could rubber band it to my face and I could walk around all day and just (laughs) smell it and be happy. But I don't like the way it tastes. (laughs) 
that's not that unusual because I used to be like that. I used to mm-hmm. really hate coffee, but really like the smell. Um, I love the smell. I love it. Right. And I, I actually drink it quite a bit now. And I, for some reason over time, I just started liking it. My girlfriend actually thinks I'm lying to myself. She thinks I don't like it. And I just drink it because like I'm lying to myself or I just think it's cool or whatever. Um, and she might be right. right. Who knows? Um, but do you, so you're, you, you do have a, obviously you drink beer occasionally before or after workouts mm-hmm. so do you mm-hmm. do you drink beers like how often what might you have drink beers or eat junk food that type of thing oh i i, I stop on the way home and get, and, and get a beer every uh, beer every night oh really oh yeah yeah i stop at the i stop at the store across the street and get and get one beer um and just drink on the way home yeah oh, that's part of the ritual part of the routine no yeah yeah it's part of the routine man i mean i'm just I just been blasting that guitar up. My, my my ears are ringing. I gotta I gotta I gotta get that ringing out out of my ears some way. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the, so it sounds like you're are you a real creature of habit? Do you think? Uh of course. Yeah. 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 It yeah. Just, it sounds like you have your routine. Like, do you have your schedule sort of pre-organized for an entire week prior I've to? Got it right here. Yeah. Got it right here in front of me, man. Yeah. yeah. I just finished. Uh, I just fi- I finished uh, writing all the names down before you called. Yeah. Okay. Of all the clients. Yeah, all the clients. Yeah. 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 I run this business uh, with pencil and paper, man. Oh wow! So you you have no electronic calendar, nothing like that. Nope. Nope. The four P's. The four P's: pencil, paper, phone, and personality. That's all it takes to succeed in this business. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that as your quote on the post. I think that's, that's the best thing you said. <laughs> now you've obviously said far more insightful things than that, but, <laughs> but no, that's good advice. I think, um, keeping it, keeping it simple, uh, hard work is the, the, you know, the, the variable that I think people perhaps need to focus on the most. Um, few more questions for you, Doug. Is that all right? I've got, it's, uh, these are, these sure. are kind of the rapid fire round now. So these, yeah, are, we're good. We're good, man. We're good. Go ahead. Sweet. So questions are kind of rapid fire ish, but, um, you can answer them. Obviously take, take your time. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. This is, this is a, this is a long story. Uh, um, Great. And it's not, it's not really advice. It's just something I stumbled upon. Um, and it's uh, when I first was trying to get my business off the ground back in 1988, I was, I was taking every little, uh, side job I could. So I got hired by this couple to, to house sit when they traveled, but they traveled all the time. So I'd stay in their house and they would, they would pay me like, hundred bucks a night while they were gone. And, um, the woman was the, the, the wife was, uh, she fancied herself some spiritual queen. You know, she had every self help tape and self help book, uh, um, in the world inside, inside her house. And so one day I was looking through these, these tapes and books and just kind of, Shaking my head and thinking, you know, this, this shit's not necessary, you know, blah, blah, blah. I just can't believe she spent all this money on this bullshit, you know. And, but I saw a box of, uh, um, uh, tapes by Wayne, by Wayne Dyer. And I, and I kind of read the back of the box and I said, well, this, this guy sounds like he's pretty sane. This was before he went, he went, he did go insane, but, uh, so I put these tapes in, listened to them, and I think the title of the uh, the series was "You'll See It When You Believe It." And I listened to the series of tapes, and I was like, "Man, this guy, he's got it figured out," you know. So I think the best advice would it, it came from a, a taped series of someone telling me that if I really thought about it hard enough, I could do whatever I wanted to do. Okay. Hmm. And the other thing uh, that got me early on was I and I've t- I told this story to to Dave Durrell, I believe. I met Ken Leisner in 1983 at the Senior Nationals in Austin, Texas. And I walked up to him, I introduced myself and I said I said I want to do what you do. And he says he says what do you mean? I said 
I want to get a gym and I want, I want to train people. And he looked at me and he said, well, do it. And that stuck with me as someone that I looked up to giving me permission to do whatever I wanted to do. I love that. Just on that note, what, um, what advice, you know, for, for the, for the, for the budding entrepreneurs that are listening to this or those that have already had businesses, what do you have any important advice to give those people? Uh, for those, uh, starting out, I would mm. say the 40 hour work week is for losers. <laughs> what work so, week I should mean, they be aspiring to there? Uh, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not going to put a number on it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> but if you're going to, if you're going to, if you want to own your own business and make money at it early on without having to go get a loan, um, you got to keep it lean and you got to be there at the, at the business, you know, um, you've got to work it. You can't, you can't let others handle it. You, you've got, you've got to be there. Mm. Just reflecting on what you just said just now about the wise words delivered by Ken Leisner, which were obviously very straightforward. It's really interesting. I did not expect that from you. I, I, I suppose I, I judged you a bit, Doug. I thought, you know, there's no way you'd ever be open to the spiritual stuff or the personal development stuff. I just, just looking at your, you know, what I learned from, you know, in terms of my reading and watching interviews, you, uh, sorry, videos of you and that kind of thing. I thought anything like that you would discard. But to think that, you know, you, you uh, have an, a, a quite an open mind for some of that stuff from what it sounds like. Uh, well, no, 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 no. Let me go back. I, I don't have a spiritual bone in my body. Got it's it. just whatever, it's just whatever he said in these tapes. It, uh, Wayne Dyer's early work was actually more, uh, common sense business oriented. But when he right. said that if you think about it hard enough, uh, it's going to happen for you, you know, that, that's about as spiritual as I get. <laughs> <laughs> I don't go, I don't go any further than that. You know? <laughs> Oh yes, yeah. so it sounds like very practical advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm very similar. I anything that's very woo, I, I quickly become skeptical. Is you know, I have a kind of a healthy skepticism for stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. But but um, but no, I, I am drawn more towards the kind of practical application uh, of of some of this personal development stuff, similar to you. Um, but but have you not have you not really looked do you i mean do you read much in terms of that type of stuff now or is it no 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 no, no i read uh, i'm i'm i've gone back to my uh my uh fiction roots i'm reading a lot of fiction these days so um gone back to reading reading some modern uh, classics so what well, ones give us some examples um after wrestling with it and trying to start it uh for years and years, I, I finally uh, plowed through sometimes a great notion by Ken Kesey, uh, and I'm about to restart, and I'm, I'm, I'm about to reread um, Blood Mer Meridian by Cormac McCarthy, and I've got I've just got books lined up on both sides of the bed, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> sounds good i'm not i'm not familiar with those so um but they sound interesting certainly from the titles um what uh what have you changed your mind about regarding exercise if anything in recent memory i haven't changed my mind up about much but i'll tell you what the the, yeah. the exercise industry has changed their mind up they can't make up their fucking mind you know yeah I mean, now we have all these books about, you know, how to walk and how to sit and how to chew and how to sleep. And, you know, you have to have a, a stand up desk or a treadmill desk. And, you know, you can't have any furniture in your home. You have to sit on the floor and sleep on a mat on the floor and you have to wear the fucking five toed shoes. I mean, <laughs> it's, just, it's, just <laughs> it's just crazy. You just think it's gone a bit nuts. It's it's gone it's 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 gone insane. Do you think there is some positive application in some of these things? Like, is it fair to throw it the kind of baby out with the bathwater? Uh, well, I've I've been preaching the I've been preaching the the uh, the flat sold shoe thing for 
for decades. Nobody listens to me, but you know, if you want to have a better leg press or better squat, uh, you get you some cheap flat soled sneakers Uh and you're going to have major improvement on your first workout. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. Well, Steve, so as well, far as yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say, what, what's the? I'm interested. Like, why? I agree with you completely, and I found that for myself. But what? What's the reason why a flat sole would make someone more effective at, I suppose, typically leg pressing type exercises or squatting? Okay, if you if you if you sit in a leg press machine barefooted, okay, and you try to raise your heel and push with through your toes and the balls of your feet, guess what's going to happen? Nothing. Mm. And if and if something does happen, it's going to send uh, pain directly to your knee. All right. Mm-hmm. You've got to remember, like on the leg press, the, the glutes are the prime movers. So with a flat foot, you can better engage the glutes to get the thing moving, to keep it moving. And you've got some very stylish sets of Converse's I've seen. Uh, I've got about 65, 70 pair, yeah. Jesus. <laughs> Are you serious? I'm serious. I'm serious. For someone who's not, um, who's, uh, who's not that into popular culture, that seems quite um, extreme. Uh, <laughs> I, I, if I see them, i got to have them. You know? and, Do you have pink you know, they, ones? I have pink. Yes, oh, I, I thought do. I saw you in pink ones. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Snazzy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, <laughs> interesting, resp- interesting answer you gave in, re- in response to what you changed your mind about, because, um, yeah, I, I agree. It's, uh, it would seem that the, the principles, the broad principles anyway, in exercise kind of remain the same. Um, and you know, the, the, the fitness industry is always, changing its mind to profit right it complicates the profit for the most part to come out with some right. fad to make a to make to make money um, well he, at my gym here's what i do it's it's akin to selling hamburgers that's what i sell i sell hamburgers you can have mustard and ketchup and that's all you get okay if you want chili on it i don't do that if you want uh, mushroom Swiss, I don't do that. I'm going to sell you a hamburger, okay? So take this hamburger and make it the best part of your day. <laughs> so in other words, we do strength training here. You want anything else, fuck off. <laughs> exactly. exactly. <laughs> right. This is not a fucking buffet. We're not going to pick a little Pilates here and a little yoga over here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> What's the... Uh... I think you may have asked this already, and this is kind of my final question for you, Doug, and then we'll wrap up and get your contact details, et cetera, um, if you want to give those. What is the best investment of time, energy, and money you have ever made? Oh, man. I just say time, energy, or money. Any- <sighs> Frick. Time, energy, money. Uh, um, I think it had to have been when... I bought my current building yeah. that, I, that, I, that I'm in right now. That sounds like the obvious answer based on because, because, yeah, because the seller, the seller offered it to me and I said, no. And I just waited, I just waited and he came back and he lowered the price drastically. Yeah. And I tried to control my glee so he wouldn't know, you know. <laughs> and I, 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 I asked my accountant about it. I said, "What do you think?" And he, and he, he was flabbergasted. He said, "You have, you have to do it. You know, you have to do it. It's, it's, it's too good of a deal." So I would say that that's it. I, I, uh, I have no debt. I am debt free totally. My, my, my whole existence is there's no debt involved in anything. So everything I have is paid for every everything we have at home is paid for so yeah so you own your house no mortgage no i have no debt man nothing no debt awesome good for you <laughs> man that's cool did you do you find that makes for a much less stressful life oh yeah sure yeah of course yeah. <laughs> of course um 
Where is the gym exactly? You mean uh, uh, what city or, or where on or where on the street? Well, both the full address, okay. if, if you don't mind. Oh, 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 you, you, <laughs> oh, okay. You want the you want the exact address? Yeah, why not? Okay, fifty eight oh five East Kings Highway in Shreveport, Louisiana, and it's the building in the back. Awesome. You can't see it from the street. You can't see it from the street. And that's the way I like it. <laughs> and I. Yeah, I mean, I know you've got enough clients, Doug, but I, I suppose it wouldn't hurt to drive a few more from the listeners on this show, perhaps. Um, what's the best way for people to find out more about you at all? Doug? Uh, like, what, oh. where, I, I know you're you're not on the internet very much, um, but is there any, no. any place, any way that the listeners can get in touch with you? Or it, it's completely up to you. If you'd rather not get the emails, then that's fine. But it's in case you yeah, want yeah, to yeah, yeah, they, they they can email me. They can email me. Uh, it, it's deep squat one, the number one at AOL.com. That, that email domain is so you. <laughs> 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 I got, I was looking and at they your, can, you yeah. know, listeners, they can email me anytime. I mean, I do, you know, I always book out time for, um, for Sunday, uh, get togethers. I've actually got, uh, a get together um, this coming Sunday from someone who found me. So uh, they're 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 coming from 220 miles away for a for a Sunday uh, seminar. So oh, great! Is that what's that seminar you do? Is that? Is that... Uh, it's just, it's just whatever they want, man. Just whatever they want. Okay, cool. It could be it could it could be a talk. It could be a workout. It could be a partial workout. It could be uh me demonstrating things just just whatever just whatever they 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 uh they they want do you know if i'm ever in town i'd love to do a workout at your place yeah come on man yeah i'd love that um maybe one day i have got plans i'm actually going to be in the i'm going to be in minnesota next year i know that's miles away from you um Mm -hmm. but I do plan to do more trips to the u.s in the future so watch this space and i'll let you know great Um, great so is there anything else you want to leave the listeners with, Doug? Uh, I'm just, I'm going to wrap up now, but I wondered if there was anything, any parting words, or advice to the budding entrepreneurs or the guys who are, you know, they're doing high intensity training and they're looking for ways they can get better results. Is there anything else you want to leave them with? Uh, for the, for the, I think for the business guys, I'd say, you know, if you keep your passion, if you keep your passion up and you tell yourself that you're good at what you do, um, you can walk into any parking lot right now and pick up two clients. Just walk up to them, say hello to them, tell them what you do, and 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 pick and, and pick them up as clients. I've done it too many times to know that I'm not I'm not bullshitting you here. Yeah, but that's because they just see your traps, Doug, and they just <laughs> <laughs> they're they're <laughs> they're enthralled. <laughs> <laughs> oh well that's about all i have to say <laughs> no I, lo- I, I i lo- i love that so you've actually have dr- drummed up business in a parking lot oh yeah 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 I've, I've i've made the point to tell people you know i can be under my car working on my car i can be dirty and oily as hell and have to go to the park store to pick up something i need and i can come out with two clients how does that happen it's just it's just Charisma. I don't know. I I, I, I don't know. It's just uh, you know when I get when I get into the mood, I can I can converse with anyone. If I'm not in the mood, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna even gonna look your way, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> interesting. No, I think that's great advice. That whole, you know, just do it. Just uh, you want to achieve something, you've got to hustle. You've got to get out there. You've got to embrace that feeling of being uncomfortable. Um, it's it's just a given, isn't it? Really, with, uh, with it is, man. It of is. Success in business, um, Doug. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Um, you are a really interesting character, and I think we got some real good stuff, and we re- recorded some real good stuff here. So I'm really pleased we did this. Maybe we can do a part two someday. That would be very cool. Um, sure, sure. 
for everyone listening, for all of the show notes, links and resources that Doug and I mentioned in this episode and to see the same for all episodes, please go to corporatewarrior.org. And until next time, guys, thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. Before you head off, head on over to corpwarrior.com to get your free ebook with six interview transcripts with some of my top guests, including Dr. Doug McGuff, Drew Bay, and Bill Day Simone, on how to optimize muscle gain, fat loss, and overall health in an efficient, effective, and sustainable way. These transcripts are not verbatim, deliberately. Instead, they've been transcribed in an easy read format to make it more enjoyable and easier for you to quickly pick out what you need and start getting results. To get your ebook, head on over to corp warrior.com that's c-o-r-p warrior.com and enter your email address then check your email for an email from me with a confirmation link once you click the link you'll be instantly redirected to a pdf version of the transcripts this episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I've ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly, and I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done, and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular vascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity training trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and how you can get $1,000 off software licensing when you place an order, that's right guys, $1,000 off, please go to arxfit.com and mention corporate warrior in the how did you hear about us field so again to get a thousand dollars off software licensing when you order head on over to arxfit.com and into corporate warrior in the how did you hear about us field this podcast is brought to you by hituni.com hituni.com are a provider of amazing online courses for high intensity training qualifications hituni comes highly recommended by the best in the field including body by science co-author dr doug mcguff discover strength ceo luke carlson and trainer and founder of bay.com drew bay it was founded by my friend author and longtime personal trainer simon shawcross who's also been a guest on the podcast simon has 15 years experience training clients and is supervisor of a 15 15,000 high intensity training workouts. Using knowledge from experts like Skylar Tanner, Dr. James Steele, Dr. Ellington Darden, Hit Uni is a goldmine for learning everything to do with high intensity training. The courses are delivered online through the website where you can learn via a variety of multimedia materials at your own pace. There's online support and a discussion forum where you can share ideas and ask for help. To learn more about high intensity training and improve my own results, I started their personal trainer course. The content is amazing, the courses are really easy to follow, and each section is organized into bite sized chunks that give you a real sense of achievement after you complete each one. I should also mention there is a DIY course, so this is the course for you if you're not necessarily a personal trainer but you want to learn more about high intensity training and how to implement it for maximum benefit in your own exercise regime. To get your exclusive Corporate Warrior 10% discount, discount on any course you purchase simply head on over to hituni.com that's h-i-t-uni u-n-i.com and enter the coupon code cw10 that's cw in the number 10 so again head on over to hituni.com pick your course and enter the coupon code cw10 for 10 percent discount thank you for your support